They came as underdogs, but left as the most popular sporting team to ever visit Australia. As the nation tried to catch its breath after the remarkable tide test, it was thought that things could not possibly get better. But they did. Every test produced its own high drama. I remember hearing the crowd booing, uh, your captain, which you've been off for some time. 70,103 people there, I think. Or well, there would have been at least 11 or 12 who didn't boo me. The Australian public's affection for the West Indies team was spontaneous and unique. The final test in Melbourne attracted a world record crowd. The bell came off, there's no doubt about that. And the umpires are conferring at the moment. And when it was all over, a perpetual trophy was named in honour of the visiting captain. The first test in Brisbane had created history. It was the first ever tie in 83 years of test cricket. The feeling about the match, it, I know it was a wonderful game and it did lead to other great things. It might not have. There's no reason why the rest of that tour should have been so good. But it certainly did set up the tour and uh, it set up cricket in a different way. From that moment on, um, we were combatants, but we were, I don't know, there was, there was a, a, a real bond between the two teams. That, that goodwill, that love, that fellowship. You can play good cricket and still enjoy it. I think that test proved that. Those were the days too when, when cricket was more or less dying in Australia, from what I remember. And, and this first test match brought everything back to life. And um, there were two fantastic captains, both playing a, uh, positive cricket. We'd become sort of static with test cricket. And all of a sudden the West Indies had revitalised it. And as I say, that takes two to tango. And I think that's where Benno and Worrell jointly should be given the, the, the thing. Not, it wasn't just the West Indies that brought it back. I think Benno and Worrell as captains did it. Frank Worrell and Richie Benno toss in near century Melbourne heat prior to the start of the second test match. A good first day crowd of 32,000 waits for play to start, no doubt hoping for a repetition of the sensational first test in Brisbane. Any hopes the West Indies had of building on their fine showing in Brisbane was slowly extinguished in the Melbourne heat by some solid Australian batting. Harvey is on the lookout for runs and at this stage looks to be in no trouble against the opening attack. Some spirited batting by test debutant Johnny Martin pushed Australia's total past 300. And when Worrell comes on again, Martin hits him for a towering six to bring up the Australian 300. The Melbourne crowd has taken Johnny Martin to its heart. Chasing 348, the West Indies were soon in trouble. Once again, Alan Davidson was the destroyer. A faint touch and the West Indies have lost their first wicket. Davidson is bowling with plenty of life, but Kanhai's in brilliant form and his fluent off drive brings him another three runs. Kanhai's superb 84 was not enough. The West Indies innings crumbled. Wes Hall is next in, and much to the delight of everyone, he wastes no time in cracking Davidson through the slips for a speedily run three. However, some comic relief was once again provided by Wesley Hall. Now let's watch Wesley Hall, the crowd pleaser, as he faces Benno. When Hall's batting, there's always something doing, whether it's running between wickets, an exaggerated defensive stroke, or an appeal for LBW. There's no doubting the popularity of Wesley Hall. And this seems to apply equally to the players as well as to the cricketing public. A huge swing and then bold neck and crop by Davidson with Martin smartly catching the ball. West Indies all out 181, 167 behind and Alan Davidson taking the bowling honours with a splendid 6 for 53. 
Benno applies the follow-on and Hunt and Solomon are the opening batsmen for the second time. After a 10-minute spell, Davidson begins bowling again and the innings begins with a most inauspicious stroke from Conrad Hunt. Early on in the West Indies' second innings, there was a rather unfortunate occurrence that became known as the Joe Solomon cap incident. But when Solomon faces Benno, the West Indians are to suffer a bitter blow. Before completing his stroke, Solomon loses his cap, which dislodges the bales, and on appeal, he's given out by umpire Hoy, hit wicket. My cap fell on the wicket, and this is a slow bowler, he's not a fast bowler, he's ducking for a bouncer. Slow bowler, playing back, and the cap just fell off in the stump. We all knew, and he was out. I mean, there was no hesitation in the West Indies camp by the West Indies players because it's a part of the rules of cricket. It really was quite interesting. I remember hearing the crowd booing uh, your captain, Richard Bruno, for some time, which is quite unusual. Uh, 70,103 people there, I think. And uh, there were, or well, there would have been at least 11 or 12 who didn't boo me that day. Joey walked off and then suddenly the, the crowd is uh, really booing Richie, which was totally unfair. And it was a very tough call for him, I think, then, because there was no way he could recall the batsman. The man was out legitimately, so it was a clear-cut decision. But the crowd didn't like it. The games had gone so well, and the relationship between the teams and the Australian people was such that they thought, probably at the time, that Richie should not have appealed, or the team should not have appealed. I think it was a measure of how much uh, the West Indians on the fine world had begun to win the respect and admiration of the Australian crowd. And therefore, technically and legally, Joe Solomon really was out. But they saw it understandably as not quite sportsmanlike. And it's a part of the rules and you have to appeal, otherwise you're not play keeping within the laws of the game. I can understand the Melbourne public being a little bit, a bit upset about it because, uh, you know, the West Indies team was so popular. I think it was emotional. I think it was the fact that they were beginning to be on our side. And they saw the way we played cricket. Brown, Sir Donald Brown himself said we put the sea back into cricket. And I think it was beginning to show, and that's why they supported us against their captain, Richard Benoit. It's quite a remarkable thing. <laughs> Hunt is now rapidly approaching his century, and it comes in Misson's next over when he brilliantly hooks the first ball for four. Hunt's 100 is scored in 243 minutes and includes eight fours, and it takes the West Indies total to five for 167, saving the innings defeat. Australia went on to win the second test by the comfortable margin of seven wickets. And with the scoreboard showing Australia three for 66, here's the winning stroke as Wesley Hall bowls to Les Favre. He cuts him down the gully and the hallowed turf of the Melbourne cricket ground is ravaged by the invader. The teams gather in Adelaide for the vital fourth test. The series locked at one test all. Four tends to be inaccurate in his opening over and Hunt punishes anything loose getting four from the square drive. High on confidence, the West Indies fielded an unchanged side. Decimated by injury, the Australians were without senior batsman Neil Harvey, the spearhead of the Australian attack Alan Davidson and his new ball partner Ian Meckiff. From my point of view, it was, uh, was a very downcast feeling because I'd lost Davo. And uh, this, was a, this was a real problem. And uh, the man who'd taken all these West Indian wickets was suddenly not going to be there. The other thing that happened, of course, is we lost the toss. It was 107 degrees in Adelaide. And it's uh, 9 o'clock at night, it was still 104 degrees, so it was pretty uh, warm. The blazing century heat was matched by a rampant Rowan Canhai. When you have a good player like Rohan, he's in the top drawer, you know. Uh, and he made it look so easy. <laughs> but there's no doubt at all about Canhai's classical cover drive straight to the boundary. And when it's followed by a well-executed square cut, it seems as though this is going to be Canhai's day. He's in full flight on the Adelaide Oval with its short sides and uh, he'd already worked out what a good idea it was to be able to play uh, a double cow shot and hit it in the middle of the bat and send it over the Victor Richardson gates. 
When Richie Benno comes on to bowl for the first time, it's all the same to Kanhai as he swings him high over square leg for the first six of the match. It was a, the West new way of life. I mean, we played attractive cricket, we entertained, and uh, at the same time, we individually performed, and, uh, and that is where we, uh, I, thought, uh, I was taught how to play the game. When Benno bowls again, the avalanche continues as Kanhai unfolds some superb off drives and helps himself to 11 runs. Technically a wonderful batsman, he always looked uh, as though he wouldn't get out. He had a great technique, he's very quick on his feet, very sharp. And when fast bowler Hoare bowls to Kanhai, he suffers the indignity of being hit high over mid-wicket for six. The second time in this innings, Kanhai has hit an Australian bowler over the fence. West Indies cricket needed something. And that series had helped us um, to sort of uh, come out of our shell and entertain a little bit more. Plus the fact that the series had taught us how to be hard and uh, hard professionals because we were playing against a team that were renowned with great players. Kanhai's century seems inevitable and it comes when he on drives Klein for three. Kanai's innings has been a crowd-pleasing affair and his blazing hundred has matched Adelaide's century heat. The third day's play begins with an impressive ceremony to mark Australia Day, honouring the country's 173rd birthday. And when the West Indies team takes the field, conditions are the most pleasant for the test so far. Wesley Hall's limbering up includes some ballet exercises. For the big crowd on the holiday Monday, the Australia Day celebrations were spoiled first by Hall. Then Lance Gibbs once again turned the game in favour of the West Indies. Lance Gibbs begins a devastating and historic piece of bowling. Mackay is out LBW to Gibbs for 29 and the Australian total 6 for 281 with Grout the new batsman. Gibbs bowls his next ball to Grout. Grout edges and Sobers takes the catch at leg slip. Australia 7 for 281 and Frank Misson interfacer hat. I realised that Frank Misson coming in is going to push down the line, bat and pad. So I bowled a little seam up, quickie, zoom. And it was through him like a flash. Well, not expecting that. Lance Gibbs has taken the first ever hat trick in Australia West Indies Test matches. A triumphant moment for the young off spinner. And the Australian captain is on hand with his congratulations too. There was no great excitement from me at the non strikers end. I was uh, pretty cranky about the whole thing, not being able to ha have a part of it. And uh, then got caught off Lance out at Long On. There's plenty of excitement around the ground, but you tend to lose yourself if you're out in the centre. You don't get too excited about that sort of thing, but uh, the people who were actually at the ground and had paid their money to come in, they knew they were part of history. Going in after Australia had been dismissed, people were coming and hugging me and things of this nature. So that is when it started to really take effect. When the West Indies batted again, Rowan Kanhai picked up exactly where he left off in the first innings. Kanhai makes great speed towards his second century of the match, scoring freely off Misson. This flashing cover drive by Kanhai, another boundary takes his aggregate for this tour of Australia to over 1,000 runs. A thousand runs which have given pleasure to hundreds of thousands of Australian cricket lovers. Kanhai's second century for the match comes when he square cuts four for four. A wonderful achievement by the audacious little man from British Guiana. A feat achieved only once before in Australia West Indies test matches by Clyde Walcott. And the Australians are generous in their tributes to Kanhai. You don't make two hundreds in a test match. A hundred in each and in a test match every day. And it was a special day for me when that happened. Benno bowls again, Kanai attempts to pull him for four, is struck on the pads and given out LBW by umpire Hoy. What a great double by Rowan Kanhai, 117 and 115. Finally, with three quarters of an hour to stumps, Worrell declares the West Indies innings closed at six for 432 and giving Australia the virtually impossible task of scoring 460 to win in 395 minutes. Favell gets an edge and Alexander's magnificent diving catch starts the Australian collapse.
and Sobers bowls again in what's to prove a tragic over for Australia. O'Neill and McDonald move off for the single, but Canhai's superb throw runs McDonald out. McDonald is out for two, and Australia two for seven in real trouble. Paul bowls the last ball of the day. Simpson edges, and Alexander takes his second catch. Simpson out for three, and the Australian total three for 31, with O'Neill 21 not out after a sensational last half hour before stumps on the fourth day. When it came to Adelaide, um, and the situation that ensued after the fourth day, um, we really did feel we were in with a, a big chance. But I must tell you, you know, that um, one of the delightful experiences of our lives is Jackie Hendricks and myself, you know, we were that day invited, that night actually, to Sir Donald's home for dinner. That was one of my abiding um, pleasures of the whole tour, the, the, the being, being so close to Sir Donald Bradman and, um, you know, hearing him talk about the cricket and, 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 and analyse it and um, it had a great, great effect on me. And at the end when we were leaving, we turned to the Don and he says, well, we look as though we got you tomorrow, Don, Sir Don. And he looked at us and he says, um, yeah, he looks that way. But if ever there was an occasion for Mackay, it's tomorrow. Australia 5 for 129, and the duo Mackay, a great man for this situation, is to partner Benno. Mackay's almost out immediately when he edges to leg slip, and Gibbs almost makes a catch. It's to prove a costly let-off as far as the West Indies are concerned, as the imperturbable Mackay's innings is soon underway. Slasher would go down probably as one of the best team players I've ever played with. You could ask Slasher to go out and try and make 50 in 50 minutes. He'd do it, which is against his style of play. Or else you could ask him to go out there and say, I want you to stick around for four hours and make 10. That was his style of play. He could do that. Gibbs bowls and again Mackay fails to make contact, but Alexander's beaten two and there are two buys. Ken Mackay has the reputation of being the world's best judge of whether a ball is going to pass outside his stumps and in this innings, he gets plenty of opportunities to test his judgment. We've all seen uh, shots of Slasher leaving the ball go when it's going two inches past the off stump, as it was in those days, just a, a centimetre or two nowadays. And he did that, I can't ever recall Slasher being bold, uh, not playing a shot. He just had wonderful judgment. Worrell himself comes back into the attack for what's to prove a sensational spell. Grout is beaten, and the confident appeal for LBW is upheld. Grout out for a well-made 42 in 76 minutes, and when the players leave the field for tea, the Australian score is 7 for 203, still two hours to bat, and only bowlers Misson, Hoare and Klein to come in. Well, Norm O'Neill and Johnny Martin took me out for some practice in the nets, and, and they bowled to me for about 20 minutes, and I was bowled eight to ten times, and I'm playing at balls that I thought were going to turn, and they went straight, and balls that went straight, and they turned, and... And there was a woman standing behind the nets and she said, well, it's a waste of time sending you in, isn't it? Well, I couldn't disagree with her the way I was batting. After tea, when Sobers bowls, Mackay has a few uncomfortable moments, but nevertheless, he's doing a typically sterling job for Australia. Hawes innings comes to a sudden end, clean bowled without scoring. The Australian scoreboard now shows nine for 207 and at a devastating burst, Worrell has taken three for eight. And we lost three quick wickets and I padded up and the boys were packing their, their bags to go home. And uh, didn't give you very much confidence. And I said, well, away you go. I don't want to see you until the end of the game. Yeah, yeah, right. I walked down the stairs and, and uh, one of the members said, laughed out and said, ho, 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 it, it's all up to you now. And the whole stand started to laugh, you know, so. When Victorian spinner Lindsay Klein makes his way to the wicket and smiles ruefully at the West Indies fieldsman, there are over a hundred minutes scheduled to stumps, and with fieldsmen all round him, Klein sets about a task generally conceded as utterly hopeless. I seem to recall it was about, I think, 20 past four in the afternoon when, when, when um, Klein went out to bat. And of course, we were all started to, to prepare to leave, you know, pack your bags and whatever you had to do because another 10 minutes and it would be all over. Klein safely threw his first over. At the time, you didn't have any worries. Whatever happened, you figured that you were going to win this game because you couldn't see Mackay 
and Klein bat in for 90 odd minutes. And with Sobers at the other end, Mackay defends to perfection. I remember feeling as far as from here to you, because things at once there start to get very desperate. And we really had to try and put some pressure on. And I remember Frank bringing me into Silly Midoff, and I was really under the bat. Gaining confidence with each ball he faces, Worrell's next over sees Klein open his account with a single to mid-on, and in this same over we see the disputed catch with Worrell bowling to Mackay. Mackay forward, Sobers takes the ball and the West Indies players start to leave the field. But umpire Eager remains unmoved and Sobers is bitterly disappointed at his decision that it was a bump ball. And there was no doubt in all of our minds that it was a clean catch, there was no doubt. We were so convinced it was a perfect catch that we all left the field. We didn't even appear. So when nothing happened and Slasher stayed there, we thought, what's up? So we said, Mr. Umpire, how's that? He said, not out. I remember we started to blow our tops about it. And Frank says, come on, quiet down. The umpire says, not out, and it's not out. That is the position it is in. Frank was very quick to say, fellas, come back, back, back into position, back into position. You know, um, there was no rancor about it. He said, gentlemen, if you get a bad decision and you show some sort of feeling about it, the crowd would say, oh, he got a bad decision, but he's a bad sportsman, and they'll turn against you. So whatever happens at this tour, every bad decision, any bad decision, I want you to have no, show no dissent of any kind. No, Slasher was certain that it was a bump ball. Yes, no, I thought it was a bump ball. Yeah, we were square on, as you understand, in Adelaide, and we had a perfect view of the actual flight of the ball and everything, and it never, ever occurred to us that it was a catch, and it didn't occur to Slasher or... I think what happened with the West Indies, they hoped. Klein doesn't middle every ball, but who'd expect him to in this electric atmosphere with 13,000 spectators and a million more listening and watching, wondering which ball will end the test match. Slasher gave me a lot of confidence. He believed that I, I could bat defensively and uh, he did say that to me. With just over an hour to go to stumps, Worrell gives Hall the new ball and with Lindsay Klein to face the giant speedster, every cricket heart, including the West Indies players, is in its owner's mouth. Let's watch and see how Klein fares. First, a no ball from Hall. The match almost ends with a run out when Klein thinks about a single and has to scurry back. But it's Klein's day and he plays Hall with greater aplomb than some of his more illustrious teammates, richly earning the drink that follows Hall's over. We started to get excited about 10 minutes into the last hour. I started to think, well, God, this is possible. They've batted for about an hour, they've gone through a new ball. Gibbs is the next bowler tried and Mackay has mixed fortunes. But when he turns the off spin at a mid-wicket for a single, he shows he has increasing faith in his partner's ability to keep the attack at bay. When I, when I became quite nervous was when we had about 20 minutes to go. And then I looked at the clock and I thought, gee, we've come a fair way now and, you know, I might get through. And that's when I got a little tense, yes. We started to, to count because the clock at the Adelaide Oval goes down very fast on the right hand side when it's getting down to the half hour and it goes up very slowly and it, it still does. In the dressing room it was almost unbearable, the old sweaty hands being forced to sit in the one seat, players who smoked were puffing away and it just gained I think an atmosphere in the dressing room for tension I've never ever seen uh, or before or since. We started to get edgy and we were very edgy towards the end, I can tell you. There was as much shouting coming from the dressing room as each ball was negotiated as there was from the members who normally don't shout about anything. Australia still with this last wicket intact. Klein not out 15, Mackay not out 62. And great Scott, what are we going to call this for a field? The whole side's gathered round Klein. There's a, there's a row of four blokes on the onside. There's a row of five on the offside. What a fantastic sight this is. No hope of telling you what this field is. The whole West Indies side is within about four yards of Klein's bat. When we had the 11, when I had the 11 players within a, you know, a metre or two, um, 
I looked at the, the wicket and there was a piece of um, turf on it and I, I thought I'd go up and move it. And uh, Al Valentine um, helped me out. He took off his cap and swept the wicket. So uh, I didn't, sa didn't save any time at all. And now Worrell bowls the second last over of the match to Klein with every fieldsman except the bowler clustered round Klein's back. It's the end of Worrell's over and Klein's made it. At one minute to six, Frank Worrell threw the ball to his lion-hearted fast bowler, Wesley Hall, and prayed for a miracle. I don't think Slash's uh, stomach was settled because he, was, he had to face that last ball. But I, I was more settled because I'd done my job and, and played the second last over. And, and I was just uh, willing him on to get through that last over. The last ball of the fourth test match as Hall comes in. No, he misses his step. He overran the crease and he chucks the ball into the turf in annoyance. <laughs> and here it comes, the last ball of the fourth test match and Hall comes in and bowls now and no ball! And no ball! And no ball! And 20,000 children have rushed onto the Adelaide Oval. And they've all got to get off again. So Frank, um, he said, well, you know, where's you, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to give it all. I've got, I'm going to blow Makai away with this one, you know. I, you've got to convince yourself you can do it. <laughs> I thought that a good bumper would be the ideal thing. I had men all around the wicket. The least perturbed of anybody, Kenny Mackay, as he gets in over the bat again, and here it comes, this is the last ball, and Hall bowls it, and Mackay's hit high up in the body, it's all over! It's a drop! It's a drop! It's all over! Australia draws the fourth test match. I can still uh, have this wonderful uh, mental image of Slasher putting his arms above his, uh, his head with the bat held high and allowing it to uh, hit him in the ribs and uh, that takes a lot of cold curries to be hit when you're trying to avoid this is acceptable but when you've got to do that uh, for, the, you know, for your team that, that's a huge contribution. Slasher took it in the middle of his stomach and then bit on his gum. <laughs> I walked off. The next day he showed it to me. It, it had taken a, a, a bit of a walk around. It was around the, the black and blue mark was nearly in, the, in his back by that time. Could easily have had a broken rib from it. It was so bruised and uh, it got him in a nasty spot. But um, he didn't say much when, uh, when he came off. He just went and sat down. He was obviously in a bit of pain. But um, just sat down. I said to him, well done. Thanks, mate, he said. And that was it. Oh, a very special moment, you know. I didn't, uh, I don't think we said much. We just uh, put our arm around each other and um, and had that wonderful feeling that we, we did something special for the team. Yeah. Then to go in the dressing room and heard that Norman O'Neill had bowled down Lindsay Klein about four times in about six balls in the nets. You start to wonder, where, where were our strengths? <laughs> we thought it was a good game. We should have won it. But, um, you know, two men batted for 90 minutes, so we just couldn't get them out. And we decided, as Frank said, let us refocus. You know, let us go to Melbourne feeling that we could win. Because you must remember, the series was still one all. Cricket in Australia had reached new heights of popularity. The people voted with their feet. The fifth and deciding test match in Melbourne turned out to be yet another cliffhanger. I don't think you'll ever get another series in cricket where every test match in that series went to a complete finish. It went to the last ball of nearly every test match and every day. And um, I don't think that that will happen again in history. I think people still now actually talk about that 60-61 series and I do myself because I feel that that was one of the greatest series there's ever been and I think the public even realise it today that they still talk about it as getting back uh, people to watch Test Cricket. On the Saturday, a world record crowd of 90,800 turned up to show their appreciation and support for these two great teams. The fact that that many people could turn up in one day. It was an outpouring of um, 
of acceptance that uh, the cricket up to then had been fantastic, as far as Test cricket can be fantastic. Yeah, the fact we had so many people there, I think, was a reaction to what the whole series had created. Without a doubt, it was <laughs> tremendous. The roar and the crowd uh, around you, and to play in an arena with so many people around you was fantastic. But when you talk about 90,000 people in one spot, then the first thing that you tell yourself, you cannot make a fool of yourself, not in front of 90,000 people. The giant fast bowler with his run of 27 yards is a frightening experience for any batsman, and Simpson has the unenviable task of facing this opening over. Anyone that says they like playing uh, fast bowling, I, I would doubt they do, I doubt their honesty. I don't think anyone truly likes facing a man bowling at 90 miles an hour. Colin MacDonald, Australia's other opening batsman, ducks a bumper from Hall. And the crowd goes for a hold. <sighs> and it's like lions coming down. Lions at you. <sighs> Roaring. You all get the bet there in front of 90,000 and the place is electric, you know. It's, there's, there's actually no feeling like it. I've never experienced it before or since, and uh, you know, to, to, uh, in, in, especially in, in front of a Melbourne cricket adoring crowd, which they are. And uh, to go out there, uh, the, the, the tension is so magic. And I forget, I was feeling that fine leg, and you had a young lady that keep hitting me with toughies, you know, every time. Sign this autograph, me. I said, No, when a wicked fall, you do something, and you know, I start signing autograph, and the crowd start to run towards you. And the skipper called and said, after the game is a better time, you know, so, so we had to stop that, but it was tremendous. Stobos bowls to Mackay when play starts on the morning of the third day. The single takes the score to 237 and Australia is only 55 runs behind the West Indies first innings total with five wickets in hand. Burge is the other not out batsman and Australia has a good chance of building a big score because the West Indies attack is restricted to only three bowlers. The pitch is playing easily and the West Indians have a problem with Ballantyne off the field and Warrell unable to bowl. During that time we, we had a rest day in, in test cricket and Val was playing on some drums. I was playing the bongo drums. But um, I never played bongo drums in my life. But I was there playing with the sting, I hit the sting nice. I don't know, he must have, he must have had a ball wherever he was. But he came back to the hotel and his, his fingers were all swollen. And I, I wake up and my finger, my hands were swollen from hitting the drums and the rim of the drums hit, you know, the joints. Myself and Gary did a lot of bowling in the first innings of the, of the, the fifth test. And I don't think Val bowled a lot. Australia, in a very sound position overnight, has slumped badly. And full credit must go to the joint efforts of Gibbs, Sobers and Hall. Sobers bowling his umpteenth over, Martin is almost bowled and it's four more to the Australian score. Gary got five wickets, I think got, got four. I bowled about 40 overs and Gary must have bowled close to that as well. This is a great sustained performance by Sobers and he gets another wicket when Johnny Martin goes for a big hit. The ball goes to Kenhai at short square leg and Martin is out for five. A remarkable recovery by the West Indians. Australia nine wickets down and Sobers has dismissed five batsmen. That's the end of a long uninterrupted spell by Sobers in which he bowled nearly 40 overs. When the West Indies batted again, they aimed to set Australia a big target. Smith plays a relaxed stroke and the ball soars high in the air to land in the grandstand for a magnificent six. When the last West Indies wicket fell, Australia needed to score 258 runs to win the match and the series. Uh, Shimo, yes, I went to Bob and said uh, in the second innings, I want you to go out there and take Wes apart. If it doesn't work, then I promise you I'll take the blame for it. But I want you to go out there and tear into bits. And he did. Paul opens the bowling for the West Indies with Australia needing 258. Simpson reacts in sensational fashion. I always worked on the principle as an opener. If they bowl one short to me, and it was particularly outside off stump, I'd go for it. Because if I got a top edge, I was probably going to get a four. So uh, it was just one of those occasions where it was getting tired at the end of the series. 
and he bowled a couple in the right spot. The umbrella field was up, I was able to lift a couple over the, uh, the, the, the cordon on the leg side, a couple of square cuts, I think, and top edges, and suddenly you're away. took 18 runs off the over, and Australia has made a good start. You have a look at the scorecard and you'll see precisely what Simo did, and it got us on the way. And I thought that was very important in the context of the way the game uh, was going. West Indian captain Frank Worrell leads his team out on the field after lunch on the fifth day. These gay cricketers from the Calypso Islands have a serious job on their hands because Australia, with eight wickets standing, needs only 104 runs to win the match and the series. The final day's play of this remarkable series was a tense struggle. The result went right down to the wire. Every run is wildly cheered as the Australians draw closer and closer to victory. There's a great cheer for the West Indians when Valentine bowls Peter Burge for 53. Ten to make and the match to win. Three wickets to fall. With Australia still four runs short of victory, what occurred next may have had an impact on the outcome of the series. Now the controversial incident as Grout plays a stroke and sets off for the two runs. Alexander appeals to the umpire because the wicket is broken. The bail is on the ground and Alexander is certain that Grout has been bowed. However, there's some doubt, and the umpires decide to hold a conference. They rule not out, to the amazement of the West Indians, and Grout is still there. I was at slip at the time, and I thought he was, he was bowled down, because you could hear the click. The bail fell off, and the runs were completed, and the appeal was up, and the not out came. I fell to the ground on my hands like this, and as I... As I was on my way down, I heard a shout come in from right across, mid-off, I think Frank Word was. And before I hit the ground, I was back up, like almost like a catapult situation, because I realized I'd violated the thing that he was saying, no demonstration. He got an inside edge, and it hit also, went onto the, the, the stumps. And I was standing up there looking disappointed and perplexed but perplexed because he hadn't been given out. Disappointed because it could have been put down as another drop catch. It was off an inside edge, but it hit the inside edge of, of Wally's bat, it clipped the stump ever so delicately. And it's decided to wicket, and therefore the bail falls forward. Very unusual. And um, consequently, the umpire on the assembly thinks Alexander's glove must just touch it because a bail doesn't normally fall forward. Where the stump was uh, set, the off stump was set. Whether, in fact, even Jerry, who was you know, behind the stumps, had tread, trod on that crack and forced that to move. Because, you know, if you tread on some of those cracks at the old Melbourne Creek grounds, if you didn't fall down them, uh, at least you're going to movement. So there could have been a bit of movement there. As far as I'm concerned, one of the best umpires that I've ever played with was Colin Egar. I think he was one of the fairest, one of the best. And if he made a decision that looked wrong, it was a simple error. The two umpires, um, they were brilliant. And I, I thought that it was a bit much to have um, five consecutive tests, but they did really great. There were no national decisions. If there were a few mistakes and you get a few mistakes, they were genuine. I think it's one of those things that without the modern day replays and everything else, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't think anyone will really know. And this ball, he hits high in the air and he's gonna be caught by Smith at gully, he is. But that was the way in which the spirit of the game was played throughout the whole series, that Wally felt there was a kind of a discrepancy that nobody seemed to understand. 
He knew that Jerry Alexander would not have appealed if he had touched the stamps because things had gone so well between the two teams that nobody was going to do it. And he felt that there might have been a mistake, the ball might have hit the stumps, and he was batting on the false pretenses. So he just threw his wicket away. And Valentine to Martin. Martin comes back, hits him in the air, he's got no, it's to be safe, it'll be safe. They can't get near it, they'll run one. It's a tie. Eight for two, five, seven. Mackay is facing Valentine. It's cool. Boys, and that's the game over. That's the game for Australia. The boys on the field now, someone fielded the ball, whatever they do, the umpires are going for their lives, the players are rushing, there are hundreds and hundreds of people on this ground, and the fastest man on the field is Hoy, he's being tackled, he's through about four tackles, he makes the members stand, but where's umpire Eager? I don't know where he is, <laughs> they're all over the ground, as the players have dashed off, the result of this game that Australia have won it, <clears throat> on the final result of buys, when uh, Alexander missed that one from, from uh, Valentine outside the off stump, and Australia have won this test match by two wickets. Something that's unforgettable. Um, you know, it's um, Nat King Cole's favourite song, I suppose, but to us it's also unforgettable because out of all the series we ever played, there was never a series where there was such incredible cricket. And the kind of cricket that was played on that tour, I don't think I've ever seen it played before or after. And I've always think back as, on that tour as one of the greatest tours that I've ever played in, um, past and present. And I don't think that there would ever be another series like that 1966-1 series. The excitement was fantastic, the results were great, that tie was unique. But I think what went further was the spirit. I think the real spirit of the game. It set a standard, I believe, in, in sportsmanship, um, ability, uh, and certainly... Uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, there was a, a something between the two teams which I could I can't explain to this day. I think that's the most um, rewarding thing uh, about that tour. That um, never before, or I believe, never since, have uh, people, team members, been able to make friends with people like that that lasted for so long. You know, my my friendship with the people of Australia and the various states, um, you know, will go with me till I die. Sir Donald Bradman and the Board of Control commissioned former Test cricketer Ernie McCormack, a jeweller by profession, to make a perpetual trophy for this and all future Test series between Australia and the West Indies. It was to be called the Frank Worrell Trophy. We one could only feel a sense of pride that to think that the Australians could name it the Frank Worrell Trophy. That spoke volumes, you know, and it told us the high esteem in which he was held. There wasn't an Australian player that would have disagreed with it being anything else but the Frank Worrell trophy. That was, that, it was a, and it, we accepted that as, as, as the tribute for what was an incredible series. When you think about a foreign captain getting beaten in a series and name a trophy after him to be handing over to the winning captain, uh, For us, it was, it was uh, an achievement. We never thought it was possible. But it did, and we were proud of it. The captain, I mean, the first black captain, I believe we were waiting for something like this for a long time to happen. And to have this trophy name after Sir Frank Worrell, well, I keep on saying Sir Frank, he was just Frank Worrell then, was a great accomplishment for Worrell and for West Indies cricket. And I know these boys are very tired because they've had a very trying match. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to Frank. Thank him once again for the wonderful performance they've put up this year and ask him to do the honours. <coughs>
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> this is indeed a very sad and happy occasion because the join of the stamps this afternoon marked the end of the most sensational, interesting, and enjoyable series that any West Indies team has ever been engaged in. It also marks the culmination of a very <coughs> enjoyable stay in your country, and we'd like to thank all those people for the very kindly letters and um, those of you for the lavish hospitality. <laughs> I've got two duties to perform. <coughs> I've got to present this trophy to Richie. I'd like to congratulate him and his men for um, the wonderful cricket. And secondly, I've got a little token which I should like to pre present him also. And firstly, Richie, congratulations to you and the boys. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a symbol here of a scalp. <laughs> Secondly, you can have my neck. <laughs> and you can have the upper half of my body. I shall refrain from offering the lower half of my body because the knees wouldn't stand him in any stead. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, Sir Donald Bradman, Frank, ladies and gentlemen, Frank was kind enough to say that he was offering me a scalp and his neck and the upper half of his body but I'm quite certain that you will all agree with me that he himself will remain in the hearts of cricket lovers in this country for many a long day. <laughs> I would like to tell you that it's not only been a pleasure to play against our visitors and against Frank but to play in a series as captain opposite uh, Frank Worrell has been a privilege. Frank was uh, one of the great people. Just think for a moment of uh, being the first black man to captain the West Indies overseas and the things he did and the way he did them. That was even more to the point. I don't know that you'll find anyone in the world who has a harsh word to say about Worrell that also gave an, in, an indication as to the togetherness, how the two teams played, how the two captains reacted to each other, and, 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 and how it brought back cricket, back to the standard and the place where it should be. Two days later, over half a million people crammed into the city streets of Melbourne to farewell the West Indies team. The cavalcade was followed by a reception at the town hall. The sea of people, the driving through this tremendous crowd of people, you know, it made you stop and think, of, you know, what the heck have we done to, 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 um, to deserve this? And then, you know, they, they started to sing, Will You May Come Back Again? And, and it was so touching. Um, I think there were a lot of lumps in a lot of throats that afternoon. What I saw was a wonderful bunch of people who appreciated what a cricketing team from a different country came and did. That had never been seen before since. It was a ma magnificent motorcade. 500,000 people came in the city square in Melbourne to say goodbye to us. I mean, that's the sort of um, accolade you give to Prime Ministers, President and Film Stars, but ordinary West Indian cricketers, you know, playing that wonderful series. It was a marking point for me, certainly. The press thought that we, um, we, we lost the series, but we won the hearts of the Australian people. And I believe that's the reason why we had this big ticker tape through the streets of Melbourne. Yeah. And I think they got a hell of a shock themselves to think that that's what the, the people of Australia thought of them. 
Um, I don't think in their wildest dreams that they imagined that they were, they were, they were sort of demigods to everybody. Uh, I don't think that entered their minds at all. I'd never experienced anything like that before. So I think that um, you come to play a cricket game, you're leaving, and people who are coming, looking through the windows at the, from the offices, and you're in this open air, open, open car, and they're waving and waving. It was, it was really moving. When we got up there and you looked up and you saw streamers coming from the top of the buildings, you saw confetti uh, coming down, and the streets lined with people, the windows, people peering out through the windows. You, 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 you know, I, I was a little shocked. And my mistake is that I, I wear a suit, I should wear a, a jack, a overcoat. All the back of my coat was, was just lipstick and kisses all over. And oh man, when it stopped, people just run, shaking hands and hugging and kissing. And oh man, when we got back to the hotel, I look at my jacket. I believe I got rid of that quote. I don't believe it could dry clean or anything like that. That's it. But they, all they were saying is thanks. We appreciate you guys being here. And it was very moving. One of the people, I suppose, that uh, I remember more than likely being more affected than anyone was Sir Frank Worrell. Um, because he knew that this was going to be his last tour to Australia. He loved Australia. Uh, had a lot of friends in Australia. And he was just one of those beautiful men. Oh, yeah, he cried. Cried like a baby, yeah. He was accepted, yeah, I think so. I think every one of us, without exception, was, was so deeply touched by that thing. I don't think we'll ever forget that sort of outpouring of love and, you know, they're the feeling, well, boy, we, we have seemed to have done something for the Australian, um, for the Australian, for Australian crowds and for cricket. The West Indian players must have come here with some mixed emotions in that uh, Australia still had a white Australia policy and uh, they were largely a team of black men and uh, they must have wondered what sort of a reception they were going to get. Well, I think it was a proud year for the Australian people because they did throw away any racial tendencies that they may have had. Dr Barton Babbage, the Dean of Melbourne and a strong advocate for the abolition of the white Australia policy, was moved to comment. It is a sobering and humbling thought that the West Indians, whom Australia welcomes as cricketers, would not be welcome as citizens. Their skin is the wrong colour. They may play with us, but they may not stay with us. It may be that the game of cricket will pave the way for more generous national policies. If only we could cultivate the spirit of cricket in all our dealings, one with the other. It is not far from the spirit of Christ. The West Indian players left Australia and returned home to their islands in the Caribbean. Like no other team before or since, they won a place in the hearts and minds of all cricket lovers. Frank Worrell retired from international cricket in 1963. He was knighted for his service and contribution to the game. Sadly, his life was cut short. A victim of leukaemia, Sir Frank Worrell died in 1967. He was only 42 years old. He was laid to rest in the grounds of the University of the West Indies in Barbados. It was a great loss when he died so early, especially to the West Indies, because by then he had gone into the university where he was a dean and um, he had already been making um, a great, um, you know, a, a, he'd done a great deal with the lives of young undergraduates in the University of the West Indies. It was so sad when he passed away at such an early um, stage of his life. Um, obviously, we lost a real leader. And they need leaders, and Frank, of course, is the sort of guy who could bring them together because he treated everyone the same. If there was a problem, he'd have a smile on his face and you can solve a lot of problems with a smile. And his smile was genuine, it wasn't a put on smile. He was such a nice man, such a nice man. Frank's impact on the West Indian people first and West Indies cricket is eternal. He saw in these islands of ours, the need for what I call a collective cohesiveness, a dynamic one that is shown in our cricket, but that's only a mirror. 
that also has to take place politically and economically in these wonderful islands of ours. And I believe um, Frank Worrell, or the late Sir Frank Worrell, um, did a lot for us in his cricket. He has left a legacy here. And a lot of these boys riding on it, I only hope they take the time to read something about Worrell and learn about him because it benefiting them right now. Legacy is the fact that uh, cricket became a better game from that particular series and from the things he did. You always need a captain to leave a legacy of some kind and Worrell left uh, one that just underlined that people who get onto a cricket field, should be a sports field, but I'd only talk about a, a cricket field, they should play the game hard and fairly and with good humour and to do things that um, make it for the future a better game. I think that's what Worrell did. I have a number of homes in the world. One is Barbados, where I was born. One is England, where I have adopted as my second home. One is America, where my wife comes from. And the fourth is Australia, my spiritual home. I'm left with the duty of explaining to our people at home what this trophy look, looks like, what it feels like. <laughs> I shall be able to tell them where it is and where it's likely to stay until we meet you again. <clears throat> mm. Having played in this, my 50th test match, I've never played in five more memorable nor more enjoyable games, nor have I and my team ever played against a finer bunch of cricketers than these West Indians. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our little ceremony, and I think now everybody can go home and uh, save up their pennies for the next series. Thank you very much.